Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everybody for joining the breakout session. This is going to be very, very free form. So uh, really just feel free to uh, interrupt me at any given point, ask any questions. Uh, this is intended to be just an open discussion. And, um, you know, we, we really want to hear from you and, and hear what your ideas are around FabNet so that we can we can help to prioritize the different things that, that we're doing. Um, now that said, we do have a bit of content on, and in particular, we're going to be getting into some of the particular, or the, the nitty gritty around the uh, Fathom GPT implementation. So uh, Amy, Naveen, and uh, Dennis, Inc. and Anav are joining us, I think. Um, I'm not sure if they're all here yet. Um, uh, yeah, I think we're uh, all here. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, so we're going to we're gonna have a few presentations on uh, yeah, Fathom GPT. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you all. I'm not sure what order you want to go in, but uh, yeah, take it away. You should be able to share screen. Let me know if you can. Uh, yeah, let me try that. Okay. Uh, can, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, let me uh, start. So um, yeah, so uh, our uh, application is um, a tool that allows uh, the uh, users to uh, interact with FathomNet, uh, the data from FathomNet, uh, using a large language model so that they could uh, use a natural language prompt. So uh, the overall uh, implementation uh, is that um, so there's a front end that takes the user prompt and passes it into the back end, which consists of uh, various components. So for example, there's the name resolution component, which you can see Worms and Wikipedia data. And there's also a SQL uh, database that has the data or, or images from FASMNet. And we also use the OpenAI uh, API to uh, understand the user natural language prompts and determine uh, which uh, functions to call for the to get the results in the back end. So the current uh, features that we have available are um, the user could retrieve images and other uh, data from the FASMAN database using their natural language prompt. And they can also uh, get the scientific names uh, based on the common name and, or the description of a creature. And they can also generate uh, visualization from the uh, data in the database. So for example, uh, graphs or like uh, various uh, heat maps. And uh, they can also search uh, using an image instead of a text prompt. So the uh, backend uh, architecture is that uh, first the uh, user would uh, it will get the uh, user query from the front end to pass into the back end. And this query would go into the uh, OpenAI uh, GPT uh, 3.5 uh, model to uh, determine uh, which uh, functions it will need to call to uh, get the results that the, that the prompt asks for. So uh, for example, uh, let's say the prompt doesn't have a scientific name, it has a common name or description instead, then this uh, a step would determine that it will need to uh, get the scientific name using name resolution. Or uh, once it has the scientific name, it would also determine that um, it needs to generate the SQL query to uh, get the data from the FASMA database. So the, and there's also some other uh, features such as a taxonomy or like a visualization or you could fall back directly to uh, uh, calling ChatGPT with the prompt to get the answer. So uh, for the SQL uh, query generation step, uh, it would uh, either determine that it needs to fetch an image uh, if that's what the prompt asks for, or it would uh, generate a query that would fetch the data for visualization or other uh, features too. So uh, once it has the SQL query, it would execute the query on our uh, database to get the results. And for the visualization, it would also uh, call Plotly to generate the uh, visualization based on the results. So once it has the results, it would um, it would format it and uh, pass it back to the front end to uh, display. Yeah. So um. So uh, first I'll talk about the name resolution step. So this is uh. If it's required, then it will happen before the SQL generation step. So uh, let's say the prompt uh, only has a common name or a description, then it will need to map that uh, to uh, the list of scientific names. So this would allow the uh, user to uh, fetch images or answer questions, even if they don't actually know the scientific name of the creature. 
So for example, if they give a prompt like uh, find me image or something jelly, then they will be able to uh, resolve that to already or Rita. Or if their prompt has a description instead, it would resolve that to a list of the scientific names that match that description. Amy? Uh, yeah. What are you using for the name resolution? Uh, so this is uh, uh, using data from uh, either the Worms database or Wikipedia, and uh, it would just uh, use Python to kind of uh, match the uh, description in the prompt or the common name in the prompt to the data that we have available. So mm -hmm. I'll go over that in the next uh, slides. Uh, so um, yeah, so the uh, process uh, is that uh, we try four different uh, uh, implementations. So, so the first uh, attempt, it tries to uh, do common name to scientific name matching using uh, um, a dictionary from the Worms database. So, uh, and if that uh, doesn't work, like if we couldn't find the common name, or if like uh, the uh, prompt is actually a description instead, then it will go to the next step to try the knowledge graph name resolution. And this is our uh, newest uh, functionality that we added for the name resolution. So this would uh, use uh, structured data from Wikipedia, which I'll uh, show in the next few slides. And um, it would do graph alignment based on the knowledge graph of the uh, Wikipedia data and the uh, knowledge graph of the uh, user prompt to uh, get a list of uh, species that match the features. And if that uh, also fails, so for example, if it's not part of the name list of features that we support, then it will just uh, fall back to the unstructured text matching. So this would just ma uh, map the uh, or uh, match the uh, tokens from the prompt to uh, paragraphs in Wikipedia to determine uh, which species uh, contains uh, the description. So the uh, Worms database uh, that is used in the first step for common name to scientific name matching is uh, basically a dictionary that uh, maps a common name to a list of all the scientific names, as we can see in this example. So for example, rat tail would be the common name, and we have a list of many different creatures that uh, correspond to this uh, name. And the uh, knowledge graph uh, used in the uh, second step for name resolution is um, Basically, we take the Wikipedia data for each concept in Fathomnet, and we generate a knowledge graph from that using the uh, GP 3.5. And once we have that, we will be able to uh, do the graph alignment between the, uh, the species uh, KG and the prompt KG to determine which uh, species has the feature that is being uh, asked for in the prompt. So uh, for example, here is an example of a species KG that we generated from the Wikipedia data. We have the uh, the uh, scientific name of the concept and all the features that it has. And uh, so the uh, local genome file that we saved during the pre-processing will just be uh, something like this for every concept in Fasonet. So the current uh, features that we support are body parts, colors, predator prey relations, and environments. So if it's uh, not one of these features, then it will just end up falling back to the uh, older uh, unstructured text uh, name resolution instead of KG name resolution. So for example, here is uh, how it's able to get uh, creatures based on the body part called dolphins, or we can find it based on the color orange, for example, or we can find the predator prey relations, or even uh, searching based on the environment of the creatures. And uh, these, all of these informations are from the uh, Wikipedia data. So uh, how we generate a knowledge graph from uh, the species data is that first we pull all of the uh, Wikipedia pages for all the uh, concepts in Fathomnet. And then we instruct the uh, GPT 3.5 to uh, extract a list of uh, terms for each uh, feature. So for example, uh, get all of the colors for the uh, species based on this Wikipedia data. And uh, this would uh, return the uh, structured uh, list of, uh, of mapping from the feature to the list of uh, the uh, colors in this, this example. Yeah. 
And uh, also uh, this step, it happens uh, during uh, pre-processing. So we just uh, save uh, already uh, existing list of uh, to all of the uh, knowledge graphs in locally as a JSON file. And the uh, KG generation for user prompts, uh, it happens during real time since it determines, it uh, depends on the uh, prompt from the user. So for this one, we also instruct the GPT 3.5 to uh, extract the object, subject object relation triple using a prompt like this. So in that case, the user prompt triggers of Moonjetty would get uh, this structure data, or like orange creatures would get uh, this structure data. So uh, once we have the two knowledge graphs, uh, we do the uh, alignment to get the name resolution. So the first step in alignment is that we uh, check the relation in the prompt KG to see if it's supported or not based by using semantic matching between the value and the list of available features. And uh, once uh, we determine that it is actually available, then we either do a uh, string matching between the subject of the prompt KG and the uh, the species name, or we do string matching between the object of the prompt KG and uh, values in the feature. So here's an example of uh, how it will work. So for example, the prompt predators of Moonjay, we and that predators uh, matches one of the available features in the relation. And we also see that the subject moon jelly uh, matches one of the aliases of Aurelia or Rita. So it would be able to return the predators of moon jelly, which is this list. And the other example would be uh, matching based on the object in the prompt. So for example, here we see that the color is uh, one of the supported uh, features. And we see that the object transparent matches one of the colors. So in that case, we will return the scientific name that corresponds to this uh, matching uh, data. And yeah, so the uh, implementation is um, using various scripts for the uh, knowledge graph generation. So we pull the Wikipedia pages, we generate the KGs for each Wikipedia page, and uh, we save everything as a JSON file. And we also generate vector embeddings for uh, the uh, feature names to map to the relations. And uh, currently we have some limitations. For example, it doesn't work if there are multiple descriptors, like both colors and body parts, or uh, it doesn't, uh, it isn't one of the available features that was supported. So it would then fall back to the unstructured text matching in that case. And, uh, or uh, if the phrasing of the prompt or the non deterministic uh, LIM uh, generates uh, incorrect knowledge graph, then it wouldn't be able to find the correct uh, answer to that question then in that case. So, uh, yeah, those are some areas that we still need to improve. And I think that would be all for the name resolution. I think Nabi could share about the next steps. This is not simple. Now let's go to the Can you hear me? Yeah. There's the, you have um, so uh, the microphone to open, so I'm going to mute one of you. So now let's go to the SQL generation process. So this is uh, the SQL, uh, again, how SQL generation fits into the pattern in GPT architecture. So, so, so the control goes to SQL generation process once the function open a function call in pager runs it and while while sending the control to function to the SQL generation function it also generates the output type based on the input 
prompt. For example, if the prompt says, uh, show me images, then it's gonna show images. Uh, the, uh, the output type will be images and uh, and if uh, the output type is uh, a table or list, it will show a table and if it's a text, it will show a text. So this will be the output type. So uh, since we want the application to be fast enough, so we need to um, be we need to look through the output output types and what we need to output before even generating the running the SQL. So uh, we need one output text that summarizes the response to the user, and we need another output content that that's either tables, images, or visualization. So um, so for different. Uh, types of output we are processing them differently we saw that when we fine-tune the model uh, like um, when we fine-tune all the data output data types on a single model the prompt would, would get unnecessarily complex so uh, we did this approach so for uh, we, we are uh, for this we are processing for type 1 and in type 1 we are using gpt 3.5 turbo we have few sorted prompt and uh, and the model generates two things, the output text and the SQL query, and the SQL query is run and attached to the JSON that the model generates. And um, we are, uh, next is we are using GPT 3.5 instead of GPT 4 Turbo. Once uh, uh, one of the reasons it's faster, it can be fine tuned. And we have a fallback, like if there is an error while generating, uh, while running the SQL query, then it it, fall, it falls back to GPT 4. And uh, why do we need to fine tune the data as, uh, why do we need to fine tune the model as, uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons and uh, we'll, we'll go to that later. And the if, uh, like if for someone who hasn't done like LLM fine tuning with OpenAI, it's a really simple approach. Uh, we just generate like the input prompt and output types that we want and we just convert that to a JSON L format and just send it to the uh, OpenAI API. Uh, we can change the parameters like uh, the uh, epochs and uh, but the uh, but the API like uh, by itself also determines what we need to uh, how much epochs we need to train our data on. So uh, for hours, uh, like uh, it said, uh, it needs two epochs and uh, for the first type data and. Uh, it ran three epochs for the second type data. Uh, um, we have seen like if we ourselves write the epochs, like if we train it for a longer time, what happens is uh, the SQL and the SQL will be generated in a way that we want, but most of the time it would uh, generate like uh, SQL with errors, like uh, some column names doesn't match or something like that. So uh, we uh, we are using a fine tune model for that and. For example, in this query, like if we are searching for a uh, for a species in a some in some location, uh, the LLM itself has the knowledge. For example, uh, it wants the latitude and longitude for the uh, SQL, and it inherently puts the latitude longitude data into the SQL by itself without using the reasons table. So, uh, this uh, this work better when we use the fine tune model, and um, other uh, other is like we are. Uh, we are formatting the output text so that like uh, it can be uh, formatted within the Python code so that it uh, like we don't need another step to summarize the response so that it's in a human readable format. Uh, also, we saw that there is a generic table name tags and LLM like non-fine tuned LLM would just go through uh, the tags table and just uh, do matching between tags and uh, so the tags table has val key and value uh, columns so it would just give the key column to Aurelia data or something like that and so that was also fixed with fine tune and uh, what we saw uh, using uh, the fine tune approach was we can almost like craft the response the user wants so uh, we are looking for some feedback like uh, if you uh, for example a uh, use case would be like um like uh, currently we have uh, the SQL generation process is just one sorted like uh, like it's on it's done in one single uh, one single approach like uh, what we could do is for example uh, if uh, the user finds it better if uh, 
Like um, right now, if we input uh, find me images of Farrelly or Rita uh, or find me images of Munjali, it will directly go to the scientific name resolution part and it would get the scientific name and it would directly run the SQL generation part. So uh, we could uh, like craft the response in a way that user expects like uh, we could make it like, uh, okay, I have, uh, I have uh, found the scientific name. Should I continue or should I get another scientific name or something like that? Uh, and uh, that can like uh, uh, I think uh, we'll do that based on the the feedback that we get today, and um, that's why we find you next is the output text formatting. That uh, we, this is one of the um, speed up that we uh, speed up approach that we use. So uh, what happens is in the output text instead of uh, uh, in, in the output text when generating the SQL query, the LLM generates SQL query and the output text and it has like a place where the data from the SQL query can be like formatted into and it, it will just, for example, here we get a species from the SQL query and, and that will be formatted into the, uh, the output text uh, using the Python code and uh, this is the example and, and this is the prompt structure we are, uh, we are uh, uh, we are giving it the database structure. We are giving it the uh, few set prompts, and um, uh, that's it for the for type one outputs. And next is the type two outputs where user has given us an uploaded image. So for type two, uh, we use another model uh, because the uh, the query would get unnecessary complex for type one model if we trained everything at a same place. And we also uh, are using a different prompt structure. Uh, so uh, what we are doing is we are doing this uh, similarity service computation, uh, like pre we are pre-programming it so that everything is fast. And the LLM doesn't use some other type of uh, similarity service that's slow. So uh, the, the bottom part is only the code that LLM generates. So but this is still useful because like, uh, for example, we want to search uh, like species uh, that's in some location or some pressure level, uh, like uh, every, like all we are just filtering out, like uh, this uh, this uh, code approach helps us like um, and dive deep into the data and uh, rather than having some filtering options or so on. So, um, this is uh, the uh, SQL and now the data flow is first we get the image, we generate the feature vector, we generate the uh, the SQL from the OpenAI API, uh, OpenAI fine-tuned model and the, uh, the input uh, feature vector is added into the SQL, pre-program SQL and both are summed up and um, we get the result. And uh, for the synergy metric, we are using efficient net v7. We did like a small analysis earlier, but uh, we've uh, so so at that time we saw like uh, efficient net was better, but right now we are using uh, right now we found out that uh, the uh, vision transfer is better. Um, so we didn't have a lot of time to like swap the uh, the database. And it takes a lot of time. We are, we are just running it on a computer on a lab. So, um, so for now, it's just efficient. Net. We'll we will replace that to vision transfer features with like uh, once uh, the presentation, uh, like um, within few days. And uh, we are using this Microsoft's uh, blog documentation to do similarity search, and it's fast enough. It does within like three seconds. So. Uh, that's that. And now the model evaluation, we have gone through uh, these four models, vision transfer, infinite V2, dense net, and infinite V7. Uh, so uh, like we are uh, computing the similarity score between every data in the database. And we see that vision transfer does work well. And um, but this uh, data, uh, like the score is very low because like uh, in the data we have, uh, many number of images that uh, many number of species that have a single image and um, 
all of, uh, we are doing a comparative analysis here so uh, it's good for now and we see that there is a like a very big uh, room for improvement uh, like we can see the top one acquisition top 10 uh, like the uh, the top 10 acquisition is like there's a big gap so i think we can make it better next like next time and we are already starting the fine tuning process uh, for vision transfer and efficient net um, we um, and, and but we don't have a result right now because it's like uh, recently started uh, and now let's talk about third type it's uh, the visualization uh, text visualization uh, we aren't using a uh, finding model for this yet so um, so uh, we once we get a lot of use cases we would uh, do that but uh, this is just some time constraint like there is nothing that we should not use a finding model or something like that. So uh, it's uh, the same as before. It's uh, the Plotly code that we are generating the data is directly passed to the Plotly visualization. And uh, for speed up, we are, we are making the model speculate the sample data so that the, the SQL result generation and the, uh, and the Plotly code generation is done at the same time. Uh, and um, we are also um, we are also adding a fallback so that the generated code is um, like is run in the server and only the HTML part is sent so we can know when there is error so if there is error it's, it goes to GPT four and then um, uh, that's it and uh, so that's the fallback and what we are expecting with uh, the Feedback is like we can fine tune the network to to uh, like have the response in a format that we want. Like uh, I would show the example, but it's on my laptop. But uh, like uh, for example, something that's obvious to us. Like uh, for example, when generating a pie chart, uh, I think you can see in the demo side. Uh, while generating the pie chart, like it shows some data that uh, doesn't have, uh, like um, it shows the labels that doesn't have data, and it just like puts the um, puts the label. It puts the label and like glitches out. Uh, like uh, to fix that, we could like directly output, uh, directly send another prompt, like remove that, uh, remove that, um, uh, remove the date remove the grouping that doesn't have data and so on so uh, and that's obvious to us we will do that but uh, we want uh, like feedback from like research scientists for like uh, um, the and the response and the the result that uh, they expect may not be what we uh, what we are what we expect so uh, if there are any use cases where the result is uh, like result should be obvious enough uh, then uh, we want the feedback and next is pattern analysis. Okay, um, I'm Dennis and I'm going to talk about uh, pattern analysis in pattern GPT. Okay, so uh, in, in pattern analysis, we're trying to use uh, pattern analysis to speed up the manual labeling process or even build an automatically labeling system. And why we try uh, how we do this is like we will uh, segment the target from the background first. Uh, not only remove the background, but also we can select a specific target from a uh, multiple uh, fish inside a image. And then we will divide the target into uh, detailed patterns. Now we did uh, now we we'll extract the patterns through color, but we will see uh, if there is like edge detection or anything else to separate the patterns in the future. And why we're doing this is because uh, the first, we want to use split model to uh, generate description for the pattern analysis. But if we throw an entire image into split model, it will use try to use a sentence to describe the whole image. But we wanted to focus on the patterns, so we need to separate patterns and and throw it to bleep model to generate the discretion separately. And then, and on the other side, we can also use uh, the detailed patterns to do conver convolutional neural network research, uh, the the search to search for the species with similar patterns. 
So uh, from the segment part, we are using SEN uh, from made up to separate the background and the target out. And the pattern extraction part, now we're focusing on color first because color is the easiest way to um, to distinguish different patterns on, on the spaces. And we're using HSV value and image process method to separate the patterns out. So we can see that this fish we can separate into, sorry, uh, we can separate it into three different colors, main colors, which is uh, yellow, blue, and white. And we can also see stripes on the yellow one and the blue one. Then we will use these patterns to search for all the species that have similar uh, yellow stripes or blue stripes. Okay, um, to, uh, as for the pattern similarity search, I will hand over to Ink. Okay, um, where I, oh, I just go through it uh, very quick. Um, in, um, in our patterns, oh uh, yeah, you, you can. Okay, uh, so should I search on the screen? Uh, okay, uh, can you see, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, here uh, we have a pattern similarity search, which is based on the uh, feature vector generated by the CNN network for, uh, for in, in this case, we use the uh, efficient IB7. Um, so basically we just, uh, uh, we use our little, uh, test data set and we use some script to generate uh, to separate the uh, color patterns into set uh, into several different pictures and we store that into a vector database in this case we use Muvis to do this job um, and we simply uh, search for the uh, the most similar uh, pattern image and we return to the user the the fish Alas, so uh, I will I will go through the user interface very quickly. So uh, this is uh, as you can see, we have a uh, picture up uploader where we where user can upload the image, and we use send to uh, remove the background. Uh, here we provide three different masks because uh, that's uh, for for different masks. Sometimes it will like uh, re uh, remove, uh, so uh, it, it, it will it will f f falsely remove some uh object that we don't do we don't want it to remove. So yeah, that's what we that's that's a walk around for now. So here uh, we we plan to add some upscaling and uh, upsampling. Uh, uh functionalities so uh we can uh like increase the resolution and here the re uh, the result on the right hand side is sorted based on the similarity uh metrics uh, in this case the l2 metrics uh because this is a re relative small data set so the uh there, there are some um, unrelated species, but uh, we, we plan to uh, increase our data sets and do some more research on that. Uh, so we plan to add the pattern extraction, uh, not only with the color, but also like uh, other, other concepts, like for example, edges, because this uh, functionality is, uh, we, we want to like generalize it. So, uh, instead of just search, uh, just user upload a whole image of a fish. User can user can select parts of the image and uh, also apply some like image uh, similarity search and uh, do some interesting stuff. Uh, also, we uh, we we have some uh, on the development blip model uh, description generate uh, generator that can uh, give user the. Uh, some description of the image they uploaded. So yeah, I think that's all we're, uh, I'm going to share. All right, fantastic, yeah. Yeah. thank you all.
Um, yeah, so thanks again to, to Amy, Naveen, um, Dennis, and, and Inc. Um, for, for presenting. Um, does anybody have any more questions on the Fathom GPT uh, details? Um, can you guys uh, maybe follow up and share us your links to your presentations? There's some good information in there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Got the, we have a link in the chat. Uh, let me copy that. Okay, so uh, here's the presentation link. And, yeah. Thank you. So you can just get through that in the in the notes as well, in case anybody's looking for it. I, I don't have questions because I'm gonna follow up with your lab separately, but uh, I just want to say that it's pretty amazing. It's a lot of impressive work in there. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, ditto to that. Fantastic. I'll ask one question. I, I know that uh, you had a question about um, using the relational database, which it looked like uh, was because we were, you know, we we're using SQL Server. Um, <clears throat> but this, I think, that was in in um, in the context of the features that were stored from EfficientNet for the uh, the FathomNet images, right? And we we're just using SQL Server for that, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. But it sounded like maybe for the uh, the pattern search, there was a different uh, database. Is that correct? Uh, Is yes. it Milvis? Uh, yes, we, we use, use Milvis as the background vector database, but uh, for now we are kind of like uh, doing our, uh, creating our own database because we need to extract patterns and store it. Okay, awesome. We're not, we're not trying to use Tropical Fish database first because Tropical Fish has very colorful uh, patterns and then we will move on to other species that have less color and we will find out if there is another way like edge de detection or other thing that we can find the parts of body so we can work on parts of uh, work on the body parts to distinct to uh, to extract the patterns out so now we're focused on the tropical fish first so yeah, yeah, I'm curious to see how that performs, especially under like different lighting conditions or, or distance from the camera, right? Where you have, um, you know, the, the color shift uh, that occurs. Yeah, I, I I will mention that one of our uh, big challenges for us is midwater animals. And unfortunately, they tend not to be very colorful. They tend to be very transparent and squishy. But if you solve that problem for us, uh, that would be great. We're trying to do um, we we're, we're trying to do the like using maybe GPT to help us to divide the body parts of the creature uh, of the species, and then if we can do that, we can definitely uh find sim use simulator research uh, search for the trans like for the species that is uh transparent. So, uh, that would be a future work that we are looking at looking to. Yes, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so I mean, um, so thanks again for uh, giving us that presentation, very valuable information. Um, now I'll just op open up the floor to anybody who has um, you know, questions or uh, use cases that they want to, to discuss uh, in FathomNet in general, very, very open. Um, but again, just want to bring together this sort of programmer's breakout in case we want to have any more technical discussions on any facet of FathomNet. Hi, uh, yeah, so maybe I've got a question for the computer vision folks out there. Like, uh, have there been any attempt at making this, uh, you know, into uh, like doing se semantic segmentation instead of just object detection? Because I think I've noticed that a lot of the, so it's not like, it's on land, right? A lot of the, um, a lot of the animals, like they, they swim with like at an angle, 
And then when they swim at an angle, the bounding boxes tend to capture a large area that's not really relevant to the animal. So, you know, the, the, I, I see a way to solve that being semantic segmentation. Have there been any attempts at doing that? Yes, <clears throat> we do actually do quite a bit of that for exactly that reason. Um, our demo use case is using the segment anything uh, model from Meta to refine basically bounding, bo bounding boxes. So you get object detections because you can usually get a well-trained base detector. And if you feed an ROI with a bounding box to something like segment anything, it usually does pretty good at finding something in that bounding box rather than feeding it unbounded se semantic segmentation, or especially for busy scenes. Um, but we've done we've done that both for just refining um, for both um, similarity search lookup as well as enhancing tracking of animals that have you know odd morphologies for I think Kevin mentioned previously like re-identification networks. Um, we've done things related to that where the inputs of those semantic seg segmentations or descriptors therein can be fed into like a Siamese uh, network or something like that. Um, so short answer is yes, there's a lot of work around that. The trick of it tends to be that a lot of the tracking stuff likes to be eventually deployed on something real time and semantic segmentation in general can be expensive. That is coming down. Uh, so things like YOLO V8 has uh, a lightweight semantic uh, segmentation network that is attached to it that we've had some good experiments with. SAM tends to be uh, quite a bit heavier weight, but better. So usually you have like some sort of mix interplay between the two where you use SAM or the heavier one to generate your training network or your evaluation network. And then you use a lighter weight one to kind of um, slowly step down until you get acceptable performance to uh, inference time trade-offs or power envelope or whatever your constraint is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And, and I will mention it is on the found this roadmap right now. We just store bounding boxes, but this year we're going to add uh, storing segmentation masks in addition to bounding boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also as part of that work, um, we're looking to hire a research engineer who will help us in actually pulling data that are not segmentation masks. Uh, but once we have that support for segmentation masks, we're hoping to take lots of annotations, um, like point annotations, run them through something like SAM, um, and then be able to uh, get segmentations and then load those into FathomNet as well. Um, and this may also include the, the existing FathomNet data, um, TBD. Yeah, if, if Eric were here, he would tell you about an experiment he did, I think with some Antarctic data around that, where they actually had point um, point annotations and they fed those in as prompts to Sam to try and get bounding boxes in an automated way and was, I would say, better than not doing it, but it wasn't perfect. Yeah, Amy, I see, um, you know, left this comment. Uh, wondering for knowledge graph name resolution, what features would be useful to support other than color, body part, environment, predator, prey? Uh, yeah, so uh, we were just wondering, like, uh, if you have any feedback on, like, what additional uh, functionality should the name resolution with KG um, be able to handle in, in addition to the current available ones? I just want to hear some feedback. For example, like what uh, use cases would you want to uh, search for? Can I get back to you with uh, answers to that? Uh, yeah, that'll be great. Thanks. One thing that jumps to mind maybe is, um, you know, when you have imagery that has several animals within the scene, maybe some sort of an, an association of presence. Um, so if you have, you know, this this particular crab, what what kind of animals are commonly seen also with this crab? Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Um, I also have one question that I want to ask. Like, we want to do the super resolution part in in our uh, pattern uh, extraction, but now we figure it out when we do the super resolution, the patterns will change. 
like it will uh, it will uh, remove some patterns that is actually exist but but not do doing the super resolution the image will be too blurry to to extract the patterns out so we're not really um sure about do we need need to do super resolution or if there is any advice that can solve this problem thank you i would advise you not to do it okay yeah then i would just use the blur image to do the uh similarity search yeah the the, the reasoning behind it right is that like super resolution is good for kind of like large structure and filling in details like you know symmetric nodes and stuff like that but the types of details that you're talking about have very high spatial frequency and you know any trained super resolution network is just going to like come up with patterns that aren't actually like statistically well, might be statistically correlated with what you're trying to do but they don't necessarily fit in with what you're trying to do so like you may get one segment of a pattern next to another one like this whereas in reality they're always you know like this and this, your super resolution network is just never going to capture that information yes thank you I wanted to ask. If, I wanted to ask if there is already a, a model that we can use for the image similarity search. Like we are starting to like train it uh, right now. We are just finding it. Uh, uh, but if there is already a model, we can like start from there. Um, you mean to get your feature description? Yep. Yep. Um, well, you know, we've had some pretty strong success by, like I said, just using the vision transformer from segment. Um, those can generate flat, um, features, and then you can feed those into your similarity search database. Uh, the good news is that those, those tend not to be only weighted on say like color or texture or anything like that, but have a kind of a broad range. So answering some of those questions around midwater animals where you may not have a strong color um, uh, color gradient, but you may have a texture or a morphological kind of gradient associated with that. Those tend to be captured in those robust feature uh, um, descriptors. So just as a, as a strong baseline to compare yourself against, that's, that's a good starting point. I don't know. I don't think we don't have any. I don't think we have any algorithms in the Fathom that, that are appropriate for ripping the head off and just getting the um, features on because they're almost all object detectors and it's like all wrapped up in the ROI generation aspect of it. So um, you typically would do that from a classification network where you just strip off the head and take the last layer of something like that. But the it's not that you can't do that with an object detection network. It's just from a code perspective, it's ugly and hard to do. And I have not had a whole lot of success with it. Kevin, I don't know if, or Brian, I don't know if you guys have done anything useful. On no, yeah, we've, we've really just done what you just described. It's just strip off the classification head and, and use those features from a, you know, really a backbone that's trained on, on ImageNet either way and maybe slightly tuned um, as, you know, during the, the fine tuning process when we're training really the classification head. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> and about the data, we wanted to make something like, uh, okay, uh, uh, like we have a new data that uh, like a species looks, uh, weirder and we want it like, uh, a data that's not in Fathomit, but, uh, like, uh, our scientist finds out new species and he wants to check the data that's not in Fathomit. And right now we are training on Fathom data. So do you suggest any other data source that we should use? Um, oh, Ben, you're on mute. I wasn't making any useful noises. I was like, that's kind of the reason why we're making FathomNet was because like that, that's a hard problem to answer. I don't have a good answer for you. I, there are some other ones out there um, that might be useful. Like you might be able to scrape worms. I think there's like some 
reef marine life census or something like that. Kakani's kind of posted a couple of those uh, that are potentially out there for grabbing some images. I can try and find links to them, but um, Fathom, that's one of the most complete that I know, despite its kind of locational bias in terms of having good in situ representation. Here's a, a, a list uh, on GitHub you can check out for there's just a bunch of different underwater data sets. Uh, Fathom that is, is listed in there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's also this this question of the, the open open set concept, right? If you have an unknown class, right? Uh, maybe you can build your algorithms to actually say this is unknown uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to ascertain what, what label it is in, in your closed set. Okay, so we are just about out of time. Um, so we're going to hop back over to the main session. Uh, Kekani is going to uh, wrap things up for the workshop, but uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this this recording will be posted. So uh, yeah, and then you know, please feel free to send me any more questions. Happy to uh, connect you with um, you know whoever those those questions are destined for. Thanks everybody. See you all back in the main session. <laughs>